We are on our second week with Psalm 67. It is obviously going to be a little bit shorter than our last one. Uh, we were in 66 for a long time. And uh, so yeah, this one is probably going to be three weeks. And that last thing, the verse that Pete was mentioning is really the whole, I mean, this is the gist of this whole psalm. The, the fact that Jesus is going to reign. And he is going to rule. And um, that is what he's, this, this psalm, the psalmist is pushing in this psalm. So let's do a, <clears throat> a quick review. We'll catch up these first two verses. And then um, it just so happened my breakdown of these came the same as the slides are. So for the song, so they work out good. So the first thing we looked at last week was uh, the desire for God's advancement. Verses one and two. Verse one says, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. And he uses this, uh, the wording that he's using is from the, um, you know, the ironic, ironic priestly blessing for the Jews. And he's praying that, for us and his word is for them. He's, and for us, it's a good prayer to pray as well. But this, uh, the phrases he used, be merciful, be gracious, to bend or stoop to an inferior, bless us, look for their betterment, cause his face to shine on us, let them know his presence and his favor. That's something I pray for people often when they're going through difficulties, that God would, would make his presence very real to them. Make his presence known. And in verse two, uh, that thy way may be known upon earth by saving health among all nations. So this is, he said he wants these blessings in verse one. And then verse two, he's given us the reason. So that in order that this can happen, the purpose for why he's wanting these blessings is a lot different than what you and I in our culture look for. We look for the blessings because we want them. We want, I won't say just stuff, but we want the benefits. And he's saying the reason he's wanting God to be merciful so that thy ways may be known upon the earth. He wanted God's ways known. He wanted God's kingdom further. That's his heartbeat. And I would suggest to us, if we had a little more of that same heartbeat, it would affect how we reach out to people. It would affect our attitudes. It would affect everything about us if our passion was to, to know Christ and to make him known. If that was our passion, it would change us. So that brings us to the verses we're going to look at today, which is the desire for God's rule in verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> the desire for God's rule. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at this new text. Our Father, I thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you that you care about us. I thank you for your mercy that you just, you lavish on us. Help us to be grateful to you. Help us to be passionate about representing you well. Lord, I ask that you would bring to our mind that truth as we, as we go through difficult times. Help us to, to keep our focus more off of us and more on to you. Lord, I ask for your help tonight as we look at these verses. Would you please help us to understand your word, help us to have your word applied through your spirit. I pray that you would help my teaching to be accurate, to be not distracting. But Lord, would you please in some way allow yourself to be glorified by our time here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God, the desire for God's rule. So let's start, we're going to start with verse three. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. So there's a number of things just in that short verse. Uh, when he talks, about, he's talking about two different groups of people. The first one, he says, the people. The second one, he says, all the people. So who would the people be referring to? The Jews, who would all the people be referring to? Other nations. Yeah, us Gentiles. 
included with the Jews, not, in, not as opposed to. He said, let the people praise you, let all the people praise you. The goal is here for God's people to praise him. That's what he's wanting. <clears throat> and for it uh, to be contagious, he wants it to be contagious to the Gentiles so that they'll be praising him. But look at the pattern that he gives us. If we go back into the verses we just reviewed, back up at verse one, he wants people to see God's mercy. He's asking for God's mercy. God's mercy leads us to verse two, that people will have this experiential knowledge of God. This experiential knowledge of God leads us to verse three, let all the people praise you. It leads us to worshiping and praising our God. So because of who God is, we should be continually wanting to praise him because we're getting to know him better. And it ends up being circular. The better, the more you get to know him, the more you want to praise him, the more you're going to see his mercy. And it just, it should continue. Now, I don't know how you guys react with this. There are times when, and I'll use this word, it can slip up on me that all of a sudden that circular attitude, that circular happenings that should be going on get derailed. And for whatever reason, either I'm not noticing or paying attention to his mercy, I'm not wanting to know my God in a better, closer way. I'm not praising him like I should be. And as you start to pull back, and, and it, it, for me, it's almost, it's very subtle. It's normally not a, okay, I'm serving God, and all of a sudden I make a decision to not. There is a subtle, often, shift, just because you know, I, I love me, I want to please me, and it's slow. And then you step back and you think, how did I get here? How did I get to this point where I've got, you know, my, I'm copying my attitude. I'm, I'm showing, showing that attitude out loud. And it's, it's because I'm not keeping my focus on my Lord. And I'm not remembering him. This is an active thing that we need to be constantly doing. So what is it? And I, I hope this question will make sense. But what is it that makes that process keep going? How can you and I keep this process of focusing on God, experiencing his blessing, knowing him better, praising him? How? What can we do to keep that process going? Any suggestions? Okay, constantly being in his word. So that would hit us to the number two side of keep, uh, keep knowing him more, keep knowing him better, experiencing him. That's an excellent one. What else? Between worldliness and carnality, those are huge distractions. Okay, the second question I was going to ask, and that's good, that's good, is how do we, how do we make that process stop? And so, yes, the absolute negative of it, we, we stop this process of growing close to our Lord by getting involved with our flesh. And often, it's not so much the, and, and it may be different for you. For me, it's not like, here's this big sin area that now Rick's getting involved in. It's this, it's just loving me. And it's one, instead of worshiping Jesus, it's worshiping Rick and making me, it's all about me. That stops this process. So let's go take either direction of that. What can we do to either keep it going or to has, make it stop? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is that normal? I'm going to say no as well. I will say no as well. My, the normal that I see in most of us is we love us and when things don't go our way we're going to either throw a temper tantrum or we're going to have a pity party but it's getting our focus onto us and off of jesus and that's a problem and that will derail that whole process so we need to we need to praise him and we can throw in other synonyms right i adore him worship him if 
you, you've heard this so many times. If that doesn't happen intentionally, it won't happen. We need to actively be praising and worshiping and adoring our God. What else? Uh, being with fellow worshipers, being with those who worship God in peace or rail, so to speak. We need to be with other worshipers. Absolutely. And this would we can we point to a scripture that says that's our goal, that is our job, if you will. You think of any passage that would say that's my job? Well, Ephesians 4, just um, I didn't mean me personally, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, Ephesians 4 talks about that. Evangelists, preachers, teachers for all gifts from God to bring all of us to completeness and maturity. Absolutely. That's a great one. That's a great one. And it's our job then. They point us to do our job. I've been enjoying um, Pete's Bible study in Hebrews. It's been really a, a blessing for me. I don't always want to get up and go in the other room, but it's uh, it's been a blessing to do it. I've enjoyed it. And um, in Hebrew, we haven't gotten there yet, but Hebrews 10, uh, we know that passage so well. Our, I, 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 I just heard it this week, our last, yeah, this past week, I was, somebody said to me, we go to church to get fed. Okay, partly, partly. If this is all the feeding you're getting, you're starving. You need more than that. But the scripture says in Hebrews 10, we are to come here, not exhort, not, not, oh, my mind just went blank, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And that's not just here, but other places. But we are to come together to do what? Get fed? Exhort one another. You have a responsibility to exhort me. You have a responsibility to exhort each other. I remember back, way back, when we did when we had the teen group downstairs, that group heard so many times, when you walk through those doors, you pray, and you ask God, who do you have for me to encourage today? Who do I need to go and try to lift up? What can I do to serve you? It's not about me go get fed. That's a side, in a sense, a side benefit. It's about us exhorting one another, helping each other. And we need to do this. Stephen had mentioned earlier, being in the word. And I, I would, I want to extend that just a little bit. Um, I know a number of people who get in their Bibles regularly. Okay, I've done this. <laughs> you get up early, start reading, you read a whole page and you don't know what you just read. We need to be in the word, learning from the word, applying the word, following the word. We need to let this book have an active part in our lives. If I have a consistent habit of Ignoring what this book tells me and doing my own thing, I'm not growing. I'm putting, a, I'm putting a monkey wrench into that process of praising God. <clears throat> Same thing with the, the faults. You know, we can, if we do any of these things with false gods, worship them, adore them, who's the main false god we struggle with? Yeah, it's us. And we struggle with this. That selfish ambition, the love of money, the love of power, the love of, you know, you need to pat my back and make me feel good about myself. That's all the worship of self. That will put a stop to this circular events in one, two, and three that we want to see. So these are just some examples. And, and I hope that is, uh, is clear. So it should be the longing. I'll rephrase that. It is the longing. If you are an obedient follower of Jesus, it is your longing to follow him. 
If you're an obedient follower of him, it is your longing to follow him. So another thing. So here, here, here's the question. Have, have, have you and I ever seen what this verse is talking about? Have we ever seen let, and I, let's just take it back to the text, context of it. Have we ever seen all the Jews praising God? And have we ever seen all the Jews and Gentiles praising God? Has that ever been seen in history as we know it? <clears throat> it hasn't. It has not been seen. Whether we look at Jews as a whole, even when the Jews were had God himself leading them, leading with that fiery pillar, leading with the cloud, when he was fighting their battles, when they saw him, they still didn't follow him. They still complained. They still, they still had this rebellion against them. And we definitely haven't seen Gentile nations come alongside and pray, be praising God. We've never seen this. So one way, I'm not saying this is accurate. I'm saying this is a way you could take this verse. Let a prayer request. Lord, let this happen. Let this come to pass that everybody's going to be praising you. That's a good request to pray for. But I think we're best <coughs> to take it as prophetic. When we get to Revelation, can you see any passages or think of any passages that would state something to this effect? Give me one. We're told what's going to happen in Revelation. What is every knee going to do? Bow. Every knee is going to bow. Every knee. There is no, there's no exception that's going to, when Jesus comes, every knee will bow. Everyone is going to fully acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And then it's going to be a constant reality for the whole time. The rest of time when he is reigning, he will be fully acknowledged as Lord. And while we know we are not going to be seeing this, in our current life, in our current time frame, we're not going to see this kind of a, a, a mass turning of the world to Jesus. It's going to get worse and worse. Things are going to continue to go down until Jesus comes back and rescues it. And we, so we know we won't see it, but listen, this has got to be our goal. It's kind of like saying, well, we're told to be, be, be ye holy as I am holy. Okay, are you going to measure up at some point in this life to God's holiness? Will you reach that? No, you won't. Should that still be our goal? It absolutely better be. That's our goal. That is the command. We should, we should, we will never see what we're talking about here. That's all the people praising God. But that is to be our goal as we try to reach out to everyone around us. As we try to establish and build redemptive relationships. As we share the gospel with those at our workplace, those in our neighborhood, those wherever, at the store. Everywhere that we go, this should be our goal. And that is where the Jewish nation failed. One of the key areas they failed. The Jewish nation, they were to take God's truths, take God's law, and they were to go to the Gentiles. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. And they kept it for themselves. What do we see the church doing today? And our commissions, it's kind of simple. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. This is our marching orders. This is what we're supposed to be doing. In that sense, there's no difference. We are to point people to Jesus constantly. 
It doesn't matter the culture you work in. It doesn't matter what you do, where you go. Our primary job is to be representatives of Jesus Christ and to make disciples for him. After that, that's my job. Okay, how do I make a living? That's a different issue. My job is to make disciples. And that's got to be key. Questions, comments, where we go to verse 4. Uh, John Stott mm. uh, made this statement. He said, the greatest hindrance to evangelism in the world today is the failure of the church to supply evidence in her own life and work of the saving power of God. You know, so, you know, we are to be, you know, we want all the nations to bless him and praise him. Are we, are we praising him? Is that what we're going for? Is the work of God manifest in our lives? You know, because God uses our, our example. <laughs> you know, the, the, kind of the old statement, people don't care what you know until they know that you care, right? Or that you, they don't really care about your message until they, they see you as someone who is legit and sincere. That's right. Excellent point. Anyone else? That's good. One of the things that can get difficult for me with this is, uh, and I, I'm like many of you, I'm busy. I got things going on. I, I, <laughs> I had one of those instances again this week where I started laughing because someone called me and they said, are you busy? And my first comment that I want to be a smart aleck, and I try not to be, but my first thing I think is, oh no, I'm sitting here eating bonbons. And it's doing nothing. I take I was on a nap, and you know, just, I got my pillow on the floor. No, I'm not. Yes, I'm busy. And but we are busy. We're busy people. So when, when I have opportunity to put aside my busyness and go sacrifice some of my Saturday or whatever it may be to help somebody, an unsafe person. I did this a while back where a guy was moving, needed help to get from point A to point B, and I showed up and I gave him my back. And I just lifted, helped him lift stuff. We helped move stuff. That person still, he's never visited here, but he still is, when I get around him, he is wanting to come and talk to me. Okay, well, you know what? Relationship is getting built. I'm pleased with that. So, anyway, yeah, excellent point. Anyone else on this? Okay, let's look at verse four. Uh, still under uh, the desire for God's rule. And I, I, want you, I want you to be thinking as I read this, how can I sum this verse up in an extremely short Phrase. I'll give you like two or three word phrase. What is this verse talking about? Verse four. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. See. What's he talking about here? He's talking about his sovereignty over nation okay i mean we have unjust rulers we have unjust kingdoms um but it's no different than us today when we're like you know regardless of who gets in the reins of power right we can console ourselves by saying so and so is in office but god is in control right that that makes my heart to find relief the soul to rest Knowing that behind these earthly rulers, there is a just God in this in control. That's right. God's in control. I had the I use the phrase Jesus reigns. Jesus is in control. He is sovereign. All of this is happening. Now it's interesting with this verse. If you look at it, the psalmist sandwiches this verse with the joy that's caused by Jesus' reign between verses 3 and 5. Now look at verses 3 and 5. Read either one of them. They're identical. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. 
He's saying the same exact thing. Let people praise God. Let everyone praise God. And in between that, let the nations be glad. Let them sing for let them sing for joy. Now the nations, normally that's referring to who? Yeah, us Gentiles. Normally. And here I would say, let the nations is going back to in verse two, among all nations. I would say he's probably referring it to everybody at this point because of what he says. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let them be glad and sing for joy. Number of things in this, just in that little phrase. This, this being glad and singing for joy is the natural outcome of our salvation. This is what should be happening. If, if you are a born-again believer, this is what should be happening in our lives. Whether you're Jew, Gentile, makes no difference. There should be a gladness. There should be a joy. There should be a contentment. There should be singing. There should be praise. And we're going to come back to some of this. But here we see reasons for this praise. Look at what he says towards the end of that. For thou shalt judge the people righteously. Jesus is going to judge righteously. This is going to be an aspect of his rule. This is something we look forward to. Like it or not, we live in a very corrupt, self-serving society. I don't know if, and, and don't, don't judge me too hard when I say this, if you ever watch you know, video clips on a YouTube or whatever, and, and you see, one of the things that, that piques my interest is when you see someone wrongly exercising authority and someone else corrects them and puts them in their place. That gives me satisfaction. I enjoy watching people get put, I enjoy seeing wrong righted. It's enjoyable. It, it brings me some pleasure. But when Jesus gets here, we're not going to have any more of that. Stuff needing wrong needing to be righted because he's going to right it all. It's going to be ruled. He's, he's going to reign when he gets here. He'll judge righteously. There's going to be perfect fairness. We don't have that today. We have corruption today. Everywhere. There's going to be equity in his judgment. And whether it's good or bad for us personally, it will be right. He will do everything right. And I'm going to suggest again, you and I have never seen this. We've never experienced everything coming from, and, and let's just call it the judicial system, everything being done right. Because we've got sinners running it. Jesus is going to do it perfectly right. He will judge the people righteously. Then it says he's going to govern the nations upon earth. That, that word govern is interesting. It means to guide, to shepherd, like a shepherd would do the sheep. It's, it, it, to a point, we would say that he's doing that now. He's guiding us now. He is our shepherd. He is our leader. He is sovereign. He is in control but I'll use this phrase, and it's probably, it may be a negative one. God has chosen to give the devil rope. To give him enough rope, if you will, to hang himself. He's go, he's, he has given him some leeway because he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the God of this world. He does have God's allowed control to work amongst people and to do his bidding. He's not free. He doesn't do as he wish. He's not, his, his rope is tethered. He can't go but so far. And God limits him. But one day, one day Jesus is going to take over and he is going to reign. He's going to rule completely. And when that happens, when Jesus is reigning, when he is governing, ruling, it is going to cause rejoicing in this world.
There will be rejoicing. Okay, let's bring this back to us, us today. We're not experiencing this. We're not experiencing Jesus physically ruling on this earth and running everything so that there's no, um, oh, what's my word? Um, bad judgment, bad happenings. I don't know the word that I'm looking for, but we don't experience this today. Do we have to wait until Jesus comes back to reign in his millennial kingdom to praise God, to be joyful, to be glad? Obviously not. We can do this now. We can practice this now. But I would suggest... For us to have this mindset, this contentment, this peace that we know that we should have, he does need to be ruling. He totally needs to be ruling. Let's turn. Um, Matthew 11, uh, 29 to 30. Somebody get there first and read that for us, please. Very well-known verses. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. <clears throat> Who has it? Okay, Joanna. This verse, these verses, I should say, really encourage me. Because what Jesus is saying, some of the words that he uses in, in, in this passage, to take my yoke upon, upon you. My yoke is easy. The idea with that word is, is it fits well. It doesn't shape. It's not like you got some big block up on your shoulder that you're trying to push against. It's cutting in. I don't know if you've ever worn something or a pack that just didn't fit right. And it cuts and it chafes and it hurts. And you don't want to work with that. So I'm one of those that, <laughs> best example I can think is tools. Uh, to me, a hammer is something you go to Walmart and you buy for $5. That is a hammer. And I was informed that that's not a hammer. That's a piece of junk. And I said, well, what are you talking about? What's well, a real hammer? And he, and, and he, when he was working with the, the putting nails this big with a hand to hammer, he was having these like $150 hammers. And that thing was it, the weight, it fit. It just made the work easy. That's what Jesus does. He says, take my yoke. My yoke is easy. I'm going to make your burden light. I'm going to make, you're going to serve somebody. You're going to be serving sin and self and the devil, or you're going to be serving Jesus. You're serving somebody. And Jesus is saying, you come serve me, and I'm going to put the straps on you that fit so nice that it makes the work easy. It makes it pleasant. It makes it pleasurable. I'm going to give you the hammer in your hand that you don't even feel that thing hardly, and it does a lot of work. My burden is light. My, I, I, when we, if we want to have this rest that he's talking about in Matthew 11, it's going to come as we submit to his rule, as we follow him. That is where our joy comes from. The fruit of the Spirit, one aspect, that comes, that joy, the fruit of the Spirit comes as you and I walk with Jesus. As we let Jesus, going back, and back in Psalm 67 right now, uh, verse, verse 4, govern. As we let Jesus govern us, as we let Jesus guide us, as we're listening to his judgment, because his judgment is right, as we're doing this, that's where the fruit of the Spirit is going to come in our lives. That's where that joy is going to come from. When we're not walking with him, we're not going to have these results. 
when we're not walking with him, there's not going to be this proper praise. There's not going to be the gladness. There's not going to be the singing for joy. They won't come as we are not walking with him. But notice too, and we'll, I'm going to wrap this up in just a sec, but notice he, this passage shows that one of the ways you'll respond to this gladness, to this joy, it won't just be bottling it up on the inside. It's going to come out. You are going, and he uses, we're going to sing. Our gladness or our depression or whatever we're in, it needs a vent. It's got to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's inside will come out. So for me, this is a challenge. What is coming out? What's coming out of my life? When I'm going home, is my does my family experience attitude? Do they experience you know, grumpiness? Are they experiencing a joy that Jesus is giving me? And it's not something I just got to grit my teeth and bear it and say, fine, I'm going to be joyful now. It's just, if I'm serving Jesus, this gladness and this joy, it's going to permeate. It's going to vent. And as I'm not showing that, that should be a wake-up call to me. It's like the Holy Spirit saying, hey, uh, Rick, look, you're, not, you're showing the flesh right now. You're showing that you don't love me. Something's wrong. And that's God's mercy. God's mercy said, hey, come back. I, I still, and I've shared this before, but I still get that, that um, remembrance of when my mentality was, when God chastens me to bring me back, he's going to take me behind the woodshed and wear me out. And God will do whatever he needs to do to get my eyes focused back on him. And if it means, okay, I got to go through some trials. It's that, it's that bad. Okay, so be it. But what God does, he does in love. And he, did, he, wants my, he wants me back. I want to be, and I don't always succeed at this, but I want to be the one or one of the ones where all the Holy Spirit has to do is reach up and tap my shoulder. Hey, you're blowing it over here. You need to change. And I want to go back. I want this joy. And I want that for us as a church. I want us to have Verse number four, let the nations, let our church be glad and sing for joy. Like it or not, it's contagious. Very contagious. I'm not going to camp on this. Have you ever been standing next to somebody when we're in a song service? And when it comes time to sing, they sing, you know, like, oh, my God, no, no. I don't want to, it, it, it makes me not want to sing out. It's contagious. But yet you get somebody next to you, <laughs> they're loving Jesus and they just want to sing. They're enjoying it. We should enjoy it. It makes me want to sing too. And that gets back, one of you guys mentioned the idea that, you know, us being around other believers, it, it's, it's, it's contagious. We should encourage each other. That's our goal. It should be. Last phrase in this verse, Selah. One day, one day he is going to take over the reins and Jesus is going to make everything right. There's comfort in this. We should think on this. His goodness we see here, his righteousness, his holiness, his equity, his mercy, all of that stuff. It is going to be totally on full display. And you and I have a confident expectation that that is coming. That should cause joy in us. That should cause hope in us. Even as we go through, especially as we go through trials, the sitting all there is. We've got more coming. We've got our Lord coming to get us. We've, Jesus is going to set things right. My job is to be faithful to him no matter what state I'm in, no matter what's going on. All of these character qualities have been shown to us personally if we're a follower of Jesus. 
We can praise him for this, and we should praise him for this. We should sing to him for this, even in a sin-cursed world. This is good. We've got an awesome God who loves us, and we should, verse number <clears throat> three, let the people praise him. We have no excuse not to praise our God. Application statements. Can you think? I forgot to tell you to be thinking of one. Can you think of a good application statement for this section? I'll take a couple. If we're if we're truly rejoicing in the Lord, we're not going to to be this, this is something else John Stop said. We're not going to be content until everyone else is, is worshiping him too. But it's just if I found something really good, um, part of the enjoyment of that thing is seeing other people also enjoy it. And then, uh, I'm really enjoying Christ. It's going to uh, result in a great desire to see others delighting in him and experiencing that rest. Absolutely. Obed? Yeah. Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> Guidance of, of God are perfect and universal. We should uh, rejoice in Him. Sí. Mm -hmm. uh, Estoy viendo en el salmo. Okay, at the song. Que empieza con la bendición sacerdotal. It begins with a sacerdotal blessing. Y toman eso como un argumento. Y una razón, argumento, para pedir el favor de Dios. Y dice como eh, para que la, las naciones te conozcan. The nations may know you. It's like, 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 it's to do this at home yeah 
Home is the hardest place to do that. It should be my passion to see Bethany and Rachel and David at this point wanting to serve Jesus and me being a help to that, not being a get in the way. I, I should be a motivator getting back to that same concept. It should be contagious. But when we are home, we need to be the men, the ladies that we need to be to infect, if you will, our families. Okay, let's go ahead and close for tonight. And we will pick this up again next week. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for loving us. I thank you that you delight to have relationships with us. I thank you that we can have this joy now. We can have the gladness and, the, and, and just this passion for you now. Would you please work in us? I ask specifically for those listening to this now that you would Help us to be submissive to your spirit, regardless of what comes our way. Help us to be sensitive to what you desire for us in order to properly glorify you. Help us this week. Help us to be thinking actively on you. And I ask that you would use us. Help us to be able to see you using us in our relationships with others. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.